Um, yeah, my, my name is Renee Luna. Um, I'm actually from around here, the South Texas area. I grew up in Corpus Christi. I would come to McAllen every summer growing up. I have family here in McAllen. So the Valley has always been my, my second home. Um, and it's amazing to see where it's gone from back in the the 80s and 90s to, to where it is now. So uh, grew up here. I went to Pan Am when UTRGV was Pan Am and graduated from there. And then, of course, went on to do my, my medical schooling and career. And I'm back home. Hmm. And so um, it's a little bit about myself. I've been back in, the, in McAllen since 2015. Huh. Um, trained in New York City, and then uh, after New York City, worked in the Houston Medical Center for a few years in private practice, and then brought brought it that back down to McCown. So it's been wonderful here. I really enjoy it. Really great to take care of uh, my people and my families and uh, friends. So yeah. I've enjoyed it a lot. Well, I'm glad you're here. You're definitely an asset to the region um, and also to the state of Texas as well. I mean, you're a Texas monthly doc. Thank you. And yes. you have led um uh you know the industry and and also have trained other doctors in robotic surgery as well correct yeah yeah it's a uh, honor to get those awards and it's crazy to get recognized like that and i was i was happy to get recognized uh at a state level and at national awards so i'm happy to see that my work is rewarded but honestly that that work when that patient says man you saved my life or changed my life that that pays dividends to me um you know, the, the, I love women's health. And um, I remember doing it as a student, doing surgery and vascular and heart and internal medicine and pediatrics. And then when it came to OBGYN, I didn't want the clock to stop. I wanted it to keep going. So I fell in love with it from the beginning. And, you know, you deal with, with uh, families at many points in their life and huge life events and so it's a big passion of mine to to take care of the women of the community so then that goes into robotics and, and minimally invasive surgery and when i started working as a doctor minimally invasive surgery and robotics was at the, f the it was it was the frontier the new frontier of surgery and so i got to see it developing uh evolving and i fell in love with that type of surgery too and so that has been a passion of mine, um, and I, we've been doing it. Uh, I've been doing it for several years now, and gotten pretty good at it. I feel very comfortable, and, and I'm happy to do it every day. So, talking about <clears throat> when did you decide you wanted to go into medicine? Well, I had always. I, I remember I have no one in my family in medicine. No nurse. No nothing. There's no one in my whole extended family in medicine. But my father had some friends and they were surgeons. And I remember looking at them and I thought they were larger than life, man. They were awesome and amazing. And so I, I, I love them. I love superheroes and yeah, all that. And yeah. to me, with growing up as a kid, they were superheroes, the surgeons, because they could do amazing things. I would hear their stories and be like, holy shit, I, that sounds awesome. I, I want to do that. Yeah. And it sounded, you know, they were the people and they would help my family, right? They, They'd save my dad from something, and I thought, man, I want to help people like that. So that kind of drove my passion from the beginning. I wanted to, to do what they were doing. You know, what you said right there is helping people. It really resonated with me because right before this interview, we started talking about bedside manner. Um, obviously, there's, there's many reasons why people go into medicine, but ultimately it's to help people um, and help their patients. But uh, there's, there's a lot of doctors out there. And, and so how do you differentiate you know, the good from the great? Um, and we talked about, you know, how, how the, the empathy part that come that plays into, uh, you know, the doctor patient uh, relationship is really important. Can you speak on that? You know, uh, it's a good point. I, I can only speak to how I do things and the way I try to, one, I see the patient, I talk to them. I definitely treat them like family because again, I think not ever having anyone in medicine in my family i saw how my parents my family cousins everyone how scared they felt going to the doctor how scared that when they were sick they didn't really trust or know what to do so when i get someone in front of me that it's sitting down and they're sick and they're coming to me for help i i understand the apprehension how scared they feel so i'm trying to one talk to them so that they understand things i'm not going to use anything fancy because Again, I, I remember my own family feeling very scared. So I talk to them like they're comfortable. 
try to explain everything to them. There's no hidden agendas. There's no hiding thing. It's full disclosure. Mm -hmm. And to me, that full disclosure develops the trust because I'm telling them what's right, what could go wrong, what I can do. And, and I don't really ever choose for them. I present them with options that look, we can do this and this can happen or this might happen. Or option B, this can happen, this can happen. And I thought, and I ask them, what are you comfortable with? Because if they don't, if they're not comfortable with the treatment, in my opinion, the treatment will fail because they, they won't work with it, they won't go with it. So I love for them to feel comfortable with what we're choosing. Because then I said, well, look, if we choose A because you feel comfortable with it and it doesn't work, well, at least, you know, we got B ready to go. And so we jump into options like that. And, you know, it, it works well, in my opinion. We, we've, I've had some great success and, and been blessed with that. And I think it's the right way to approach medicine. The old days uh, of, hey, you're going to do this and that's because I'm the doctor and you do this. I, it, it doesn't flow like that. And I think that's where the distrust comes in because it doesn't work for everyone. You can't cookie cutter the treatment for everybody. Everyone's different. Everyone's bodies are different. Everyone's circumstances are different. So it has to be tailor made to each person. So providing those options, full disclosure, full autonomy, right? Everyone has a right to choose what they need to do. And I think that goes to the success of the treatment. What, what would attribute to your success and what you've been doing here in the region, you know, for the time you started? <laughs> Uh, you know, again, I, I think it's that full disclosure, um, trying to get everyone to, to feel comfortable with the treatment, uh, and then putting your heart and soul into it, man. I, I love follow-ups, meaning I'm going to see you, we're going to do something, and I want to know how you're doing in two weeks. Yes, did it work? Yes. Give me thumbs up, thumbs down. No. Okay, let's go another two weeks until we get it right. Right. There's no giving up until the end, until they are happy, they're healthy and they're living a, a good quality life. Uh, that's what I would like personally. And then the other part of it was my minimally invasive surgery. When I first came down in 2015, it really was it was there, but it wasn't done uh, as much. It used to be like 80 80 percent open surgery versus 20 percent minimally invasive surgery. And what's the difference? Open surgery is a big old cut that takes you out of commission for weeks mm -hmm. versus an eight millimeter cut. And to compare it, a dime is 15 millimeters. And so it's smaller than a dime. So if you got a tiny cut like that and we were, they did the same surgery that we would do in open, well then after major surgery, you're on your feet within days, going to the store within days, back to your full functioning within weeks, uh, like two weeks probably mm -hmm. versus six weeks. So when I first came, and I started meeting patients, they had so much problems and they needed surgery, but they were scared or didn't want to go to surgery because of the big open procedure they were going to have. What do you think, aside from that, what, like, what else caused that apprehension? I mean, because we talk about trust, like where, yeah. where is that disconnect? Well, they, they didn't want, they didn't want those big cuts. They didn't want the time off. They didn't want right. the big cut. They didn't want the pain. So they avoided surgery. And they didn't, they were looking for other options, but at the time there was not many options and not many things people could do. So when I came and I first saw them and, and I said, you know, uh, mommy, you need surgery. This is very bad. And there's no, medicine will not fix this. No hormone treatment, no nothing's gonna fix this other than removing it and taking it out. And I said, well, I can offer you this. I can do the sur same surgery, but through a little cut like this. Man, and from there it just rolled downhill. And so many patients, yes, I've been waiting for this, waiting, waiting, and then it just has taken off. And uh, it has become now, in 2015, from 80% open to 20, we have directly inverted that, where it's 80% minimally invasive versus 20% open. So I'm proud to say we've uh, I've been part of the, the movement to directly affect how we do surgery here. And so now I'm going to Brownsville to to try to make the same impact in the lower valley. So, you know, talk we talked a little bit about this offline was AI, you know, it's 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 a new thing. Is there any developments in AI that can help improve, you know, the um the industry and medicine that you work in right now? Uh well, we it's, we had a conversation a, a friend a physician friend of mine yesterday about that. We were talking one AI could maybe help us in the office in the clinic. Uh, with the electronic charts and maybe it can help with diagnosis codes, put in reports as the patient and I are talking. Um, 
maybe there in the coming future, in the more near future, but from a hospital surgery standpoint, it's kind of like fighter pilots, right? They can make drone planes and they can maybe make the surgery we do could work in routine cases, cases that are small, straight to the point, no variation. And um, maybe one day the robots uh, or the AI will take over in the surgical lab, like a movie Aliens where they, mm-hmm. that lady presses a button and it performs surgery. Yeah. Maybe one day, but it cannot, it cannot, I don't think it's going to take some, quite some time to, to operate under complex conditions or various surgery. Because, you know, you can't take away that surgeon's, uh, their intuition, changing on the fly, you know, options and, and techniques. So that will take some time from the surgery standpoint. But I think AI maybe could help in the, the office setting yeah. sooner than later. Good. So let's get down to some of the questions that people are asking sure. online. <clears throat> First question is, when should someone start going to the gynecologist? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I've had this question talk to me and, and a lot of the literature will say once a, a female hits about Thir- between 13 and 15 years old, then the question about their cycle, the menstrual cycle, pain, and, how, and the rhythm of the cycle. Now, I do tell them that's a great po- starting point. And I do tell the moms that when they bring their teen in, there's no exam, so they don't have to feel scared or nervous. But it's really discussion. It's discussion on how that young teen, uh, how her periods should be, uh, what to look out for, how to prepare themselves and of course as they go into their teenage years once they become sexually active of course sexual education Mm -hmm. different from what the school will give so between 13 definitely starting at 15 years old and above is a good time to first visit the gynecologist but but it is purely a informational visit a a discussion visit there's and I, i actually like to show them the instruments uh, you know, the famous pap smear that all the women are scared of. I show the young girls the instrument itself so they can touch it and feel it and kind of see what it's like to try to take some of the stigma and the fear out of it. Yeah. Um, because I know I'd be scared as hell, right? Going in there like that as a young yeah. teen. and Because uh, I can imagine like what's going on there. Yeah, mind. you know, all what, the, and there's happen, so much scary doing? stories out there and all their, the tias and yeah. older cousins will scare the hell out of those poor girls. So, that's a great time around 15 years old and especially if they're having problems because a lot of people they're not sure what is normal what is not normal versus the cycles and how they're feeling and a lot of bad cycles get thought of as hey that's just normal for you but no it's not right endometriosis is a huge silent problem that gets overlooked a lot and so around 15 years old i would say take your daughter uh, but it should it should be now if a doctor wants to examine it, it we you have to question that mm-hmm. it should be purely information and find out about sexual activity find out about menstrual cycle how their pain is how their bleeding is and then just educate educate yeah okay second question what is the difference between obstetrics and gynecology yeah, so obstetrics, our field is, we're OBGYNs, obstetrics and gynecologists. So we do two things. Obstetrics is the study and care of women who are pregnant and everything that has to do with pregnancy. Gynecology is the study and care of women in general and everything that has to do with women's health outside of the babies and being pregnant. I think one day those will break into two and there will be a doctor just purely for obstetrics and a doctor purely for uh, gynecology. Um, and so they, they're they both the same, but they are both extremely different because when a woman is pregnant, her body completely changes and you have to know everything about that. And then gynecology is everything to do with the menstrual cycle, ovarian cyst, pelvic pain, vaginal discharge, um, hysterectomy, surgeries, bleeding, and, and kind of hormones and hormone loss and menopause. And so two different uh, styles of, of, of medicine, but within the same field. Now, what are the types of new gynecology treatment procedures? Well, it's all kind of the, well, I would say it's the same procedures, but they're just getting... Uh, different toys, different instruments to use. And one of the ones that's on the forefront is, of course, the Da Vinci surgical system, which allows us to do surgeries uh, through very small incisions. 
Now they have held the patent for the last, I don't know, 15 years. That patent has come up. So there's a lot of new companies coming within the next five years. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to see what those platforms can do. What can they do different? I've test driven some of them, test driven some of them. I still think in the DaVinci systems got a huge head start on them, but there's some great systems coming out to, to rival the market. So the, the procedures will be the same, and that's taking out cysts, taking out uterus for hysterectomies and fibroids and tumors. It's just the toys we're, we're getting are more precise, uh, great energy and for cutting and really for healing processes. Yeah. So the toys are getting better. What are the duties and responsibilities of an OBGYN? Well, you know, it used to be primary care OBGYN because you would take care of a woman from their preteens to the end of their life. And that's spanning basically the entire lifetime of a person. Uh, so our duties are still prime. We are no longer considered primaries. We are now they moved us into specialty care. Um, not sure, I'm not sure why, but that's where we stand. But in those primary and specialty care, we take care of everything. We take care of those preteens through their teenage years and everything having to do with growing up from a puberty standpoint and hormones and menstrual problems. Then now they're in their late teens to 20s to 30s and they're getting pregnant and we're taking care of the pregnancy and every, every pregnant mom in between that that's happening and everything that happens in between that. Now they get into their 40s and 50s and their hormones are changing again. They're getting into menopause and they have tumors and fibroids and God forbid, cancer's developing. And so we take care of that. Now then they're in their 60s and 70s and we're dealing with late pap smears and hormone losses and bone loss uh, and we're treating that. So for me and for all the OBGYNs and my, my hat goes off to all of us who who never stop working from them from that point to the end and, and that's why uh it's to me an extremely important job it doesn't we don't just take care of a kidney or a heart or a brain we have to take care of them from start to finish and and to me that is a very special thing now what are the potential risks of not getting a health checkup <clears throat> well in our field over 100 years ago, little more than that, the number one killer of women was cervical cancer. Then the pap smear was invented by a doctor. Now the pap smear, because of that direct intervention, that's routine screening, that's off the top 10 list of, of mortality for women. So that's a simple, it's an invasive exam. Uh, it is, and I, every time they come in, I joke that, Okay, you know, everyone's favorite day of the year, the, the pap smear, and they're like, no, doctor, we hate it. And <laughs> I can understand it, right? It's, a, it's an invasive exam, but man, it literally saves their life, mm. literally. And now the HPV vaccine has been brought out over the last 10 years to uh, the young preteens, uh, to both female and males. And actually, I have two sons, and I've given them the, the HPV vaccine because they have to protect themselves, but also their future partners. And so I, I think that's an important preventional step for us as a human race. Mm -hmm. uh, but the checks, the, the annuals, and they used to be annuals. They're, they're kind of spacing them out now in recent years to, of course, in their teens and 20s, it's every goes to one to two years. In their 30s to 50s, if they've had normals, it can go from two to five years. I mean, it is a, it's a big algorithm, but is extremely important to look at cervical, breast, general health, and that can happen as, as often as they need to, but yearly, of course, is recommended. Hmm. Now, when should one visit a gynecologist or a fertility specialist? A gynecologist, if you're having menstrual cycles, and I always tell my patients, look, how do, you, how do we expect you to know what's not normal? Mm -hmm. No one knows unless you study medicine. So definitely educate yourself. You know, thank God the Internet's there. You can Google, is this normal for me? And they'll say, no, you have cancer. That's what Dr. <laughs> Dr. Google, <laughs> Google will say. Will you have you. cancer to everything. Yeah. But definitely from a gynecology standpoint, if your periods are off, come and see us. If you're having pain, pain with intercourse, pain with the cycle, really pain that takes you out. 
Uh, and a lot of women will say, well, this is what I'm used to, this is what I'm dealt with. But getting into the history, if it takes them out of work or school or something, then it's not normal and it has to be fixed. And that's the hard part with, and the women are tough, man. The women are very tough and they take the bleeding, take the pain and they just keep going. But when we sit down and talk to them, they start crying and breaking down and say, I, I thought this was normal for me, but it's not. And then we treat them, surgery, medicine, and it changes their lives, literally. And they realize that, man, they have been living, suffering for years. Um, so definitely, if a woman has heavy bleeding more than seven days, so a period should not last longer than seven days. If she has bleeding that's needing to change a pad every one to two hours or a tampon every one to two hours, that's too much. And, and then bleeding on average should be 28 days. If it's less than 21 days, it's too much. And so who knew, who knew, who knows that outside of medicine? No one knows that. So definitely, you know, educate yourself and take the information. This is the world of the internet. So there's so much information out there. And that's where a woman should seek help on a gyne uh, gynecological standpoint and pain, pain with intercourse, pain with exercise activities. It should be as best life as you can live. Now let's jump to the infertility in the IVF. If a couple is trying to get pregnant, by definition, infertility is having unprotected intercourse for one year with regular cycles. Eight out of 10 couples should get pregnant. It's an 80% chance of success. Two couples will need help. And then that's where, one, you start with your, your GYN, your, your, your primary GYN, and they can get into the history. That, you know, myself, I, I do the primary infertility work of blood levels, going after hormone levels, quality of eggs, quality of ovaries. Look at the tubes, look at the uterus. Is there cysts? Is there a structural problem? And then if everything is good and semen analysis, and that gets passed over so much. We look at the woman, the woman is very complex when the guy it is simple one test and he's done and we can check if he's good. So they, we cannot forget the guy and the guy has to be, of course, willing to, to jump in and, and give his test. Yeah. But if we've done everything and then for one year, they can try Clomid medicine, letrozole medicine. These are ovulation induction drugs that help increase the risk of, of pregnancy, uh, help increase the rate of pregnancy with medication. Once that fails, then you need something called IUI, IVF, which then can jump to infertility clinics where they can take it another step further. Mm. And so that, that's kind of what couples trying to get pregnant should, should look for. What do you love about your job? I love all that. I love getting into, and, and really for me, it's the women's health hits every simple basic aspect of life, right? Um, it, it doesn't stop from their school and going through school and then relationships and, and going through relationships of college and then work. Uh, it touches every part of life. And, and for me, it's that everyday living aspect that we can influence or, or help. Um, and I, I can't stop talking about it. I love helping people about it everywhere I go. It, it, it's very common stuff. Yeah. And it's everyday stuff that I think we can make better. Yeah. And so I, I love that part. It is very passionate to me. Well, I'm so, I'm so glad that you were able to come in and share that um, because definitely there's, there's definitely a culture around your practice that shows the empathy and the care for the patients and the families because they are like part of the family when Absolutely. they come to your office. So what is it that people can expect whenever they walk into your doors? Well, I, I, try with, I want a, a homey feeling, right? You come into the office, I want you know, my, my staff to be friendly and professional and really, I take it like this. When I go to a doctor, if I don't know what to do when I'm there, how to check in, where do I wait, where do I go, I'm lost. And then it brings panic and anxiety and what the hell is gonna happen and what am I gonna do? And I'm about to take my clothes off and get an exam and it's a frightful feeling. So definitely I try to bring comfort and care and to this experience that could scare the hell out of me and that people don't even want to go to the doctor because of the fear that comes with it. So when they come in, I want them to feel comfortable. Okay, I can let my guard down. I can get help here. I can feel comfortable. I'm gonna get, uh, live a better life. And so I want my staff to be friendly, professional, guiding uh, myself. I want all that I can get so that I can maximize the care that I'm gonna give to them. 
And then I don't want it to stop there because when they walk out the door, I'm thinking, are they getting better? Is it working? Are they okay? And I want to know, you know, every time I see them or, or falling, I want to know that what they're doing is living a, a good life. And that's very important to me. Very, very important to me personally, personally and professionally. And then I want my staff to, to, to feel the same. And they do. And I'm very proud of my staff and very proud of my girls, my nurses and the front girls and my administrative uh, uh, girls that, that, that really are an extension of me and I'm an extension of them. So when the patient comes in, I want them to, to feel that comfort from, the day, from when they walk in to when they leave and they feel, ha, something great happened. Yeah. So what can people expect for, from you in the, here in the new future? Well, uh, you know, I just want to impact as much as I can here in the, the Upper Valley area. I, I want to take care of more patients and more people and spread my impact because I, I do feel I can bring something special and different to the community. And I want to impact as many people as I can because it's important to me. It, I, I feel like I can help them. Mm -hmm. And I want to help them and love to bring more doctors into our practice, more doctors with the same philosophy, same personality that wants to really it's patient care, man, patient centered care. Um, you know, with the surgery standpoint, working directly with with DHR and, and the women's hospital. And it's very, very awesome to have a hospital dedicated to just your patients. And I love that attitude that goes into it. So very proud to be the director of robotics there and, and kind of pushing minimally invasive because there are still many patients that need surgical care and deserve uh, uh, the best. It's world class. It is top world class surgical care that you might need in Dallas or Houston or John Hopkins, anything. But we can do it right here. We can do it. I have myself. There's a few other colleagues that can perform it. And we have the institution to do it. And, and same for Rio Grande Regional. But DHR, like I said, I'm the director there at DHR Health um, at Women's Hospital. So very proud to work with those two institutions. And for me, it's just doing the office, taking care of the Upper Valley. I now go to Brownsville because I want to impact that area. And modernize medicine, really. Because... It will evolve. Everything needs to evolve. Right. It is to go with the times. And so for me, it's just doing as much as I can, bringing more personnel and, and doctors that are on the same line as me um, and just taking care of everyone. Because one day my mom's going to need help, my theas and my cousin, my female cousins. But that also p impacts the their partners, right? Their husbands and their sons and uh their daughters and everyone's impact that's why i love what i do because the whole unit is impacted and everyone's affected by it so as we can make it as best we can then i will die a happy man yeah <laughs> well doc thanks for coming in dr renee luna if uh you don't follow him follow him on all of his social media platforms check out his website and uh obviously the office locations are in brownsville and in mccallan texas correct correct uh, office there my main office is mccallan i i do the brownsville office oh and just the brownsville office i don't do babies there yet mm -hmm. uh the brownsville office is purely gynecological gynecological surgery gyn care uh, but that, that's what we're doing on that side. And hopefully we can do more, but as of right now, that's where we're at. So very happy. Gabe, thank you for having me and, and talking with me, but we're, we're excited to keep, keep going. Thanks again for listening to RG Vision Media Podcast. Look, if there's anything you want to hear about, listen to, be sure to follow us and also email us at info at rgvisionmedia.com. Stay tuned for our next episode.